let's talk uh, today about um, uh, an example of uh, something that's not perfect, like most things in conservation, not perfect, but um, an example of how we've attempted to um, respond to concerns and criticism of some of our, our previous conservation work. And so what I want to, the example for that, that, for that I'd like to use is this whole idea of habitat conservation plans. And what I, how I want to frame it for you guys is let's think about this as an example of adapting our management. We were trying to do X. X maybe wasn't as great, so then let's, let's tweak X. Let, let's modify X. Let, let's make X work better for everybody if we can. So that's the idea. This is San Bruno Mountain that we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, but um, this was the very first uh, habitat conservation plan. So as we mentioned last, as I mentioned before, um, we have a lot of endangered species. They're all over the place. They're, they're numerous. We have, we have many threatened and or endangered species uh, across the U.S. And, um, you know, we, we, we've recovered some of them. And we, learned, we, learned lot, we learned that we, recovered, we so far have delisted 104 of them, mostly for good reasons, only a handful because they completely went extinct. Um, but nevertheless, uh, even if we, if we count that 104 a success, you know, we have, we have you know, twice that, more than twice that just in California alone, for example, uh, still um, needing conservation, still needing recovery um, to the point where we don't need to do interventions with them. And so we have just so many native species. So as of, as of the other uh, last week or whatever, we had something on the order of 1,685 threatened and endangered species at the federal level. And that's just a lot of stuff, right? you know, two, you know, getting upwards of 2,000 individual plans, 2,000 individual uh, efforts, 2,000 individual funding sources. I mean, it just, it just gets really complex. Um, and while this, is, this number is updated every few years, the, the actual number isn't exactly, it doesn't exactly matter, but, but we'll call it on the order of about $4 million per species to um, get it, quote unquote, fully recovered. And again, we haven't don't have many species that have been fully recovered, so this is a hard number to figure out. But, but let's just assume that that's, a, that's an okay starting back of the envelope type number. Um, we'd need something like more than $6 billion dedicated to just endangered species recovery just inside the U.S. to, to deal with our species, right? And some things might be cheaper than that, some things might be more expensive, but, but that, that's on the order of, you know, orders of magnitude more than the whole Fish and Wildlife Service budget for this kind of stuff, right? So, so there's this mismatch in terms of what we need to be doing and the resources that we are directing to uh, doing that. And then we have the whole issue uh, with our, our approaches to managing endangered species is the idea that we typically focus on charismatic megafauna. So those, those successes that I've shown you so far for example, the Thule elk, uh, which obviously did not happen underneath the auspices of the ESA, but, but still, you know, we, a success, a condors, all these things, the great whales, these are, these are very um, cute, attractive, identifiable, um, uh, you, you name it. Um, they're, they're charismatic critters, and they're mostly charismatic megafauna. They're mostly big things, big things that, that you'd put in a kids ABC book kind of thing, right? When they're learning their ABCs. That, oh, how can, you, how can you not like an elk? Or how can you not like a tiger? Or something like, like that, right? Um, and so, again, this is just a smattering of some examples from different studies. But, but suffice it to say, in 1991, um, one study showed that half of all the money um, went to seven of, at the time, 639 species that they were working on developing recovery plans for, right? So there's some individuals get a lot of love, right? Some, a lot of individuals get a lot of attention. Um, and people would argue maybe get, get too much attention, right? We want to save everything, but, but sometimes if all we're ever doing is paying attention to the, I don't know, the pop star, we don't listen to the rest of the, of the music out, that's out there, for example. Um, uh, and then with regards to also that, that same study in 1991, uh, 270 plants and nine invertebrates um, got less than uh, uh, 
5% of all the money. So, so again, we have some critters that get a lot, some that are kind of in the middle, and then some that get very, very little attention. Uh, a more recent analysis in 2016 showed that um, only 12% of the species on, on our, our threatened and endangered list were getting um, the sufficient funding that they needed to, while well, we can't predict the future exactly, but, but seem likely to help them with get, get recovered, right? So, so again, a small subset is, is getting the attention. Um, and yes, again, and, and, and a, a small percentage, and it just goes on and on, you guys get the point, right? So we have this, this issue of a lot of things to do. We have this issue of not as much, uh, not enough resources to go around. And then we have this issue of it's sort of uh, not really scientific in terms of what resources we do have, how those resources get allocated, right? And then we have this issue of timing. So when we're going to do this effort to, to save this snake or whatever it is, um, a lot of times, as I mentioned before, we're coming in at the last minute. We're coming in after the car has already had the accident, right? We're coming into the ER and we're triaging patients after a big terrorist attack kind of thing, right? And there's person over there, person over there, person over there, person over there, person over there. And we have to triage, right? Which is a term that was originally born out of war where we can't get to all the wounded soldiers, right? So we got to pick who can we save, who can we leave for a few minutes, and who should we just ignore because they're pretty much going to die, right? And um, and that's oftentimes how we've approached um, much conservation, but in particular, uh, species-based uh, uh, management efforts. So that, that comes from the idea that we don't really start, in many cases, we don't really start the conservation efforts until they're already sliding down the cliff or maybe indeed have fallen off the cliff and are starting to fall down in the gorge kind of thing. Um, by the time we're ready to do, or by the time the, the legal mechanisms kick in and we start to get maybe serious about some type of conservation, um, we have usually very few individuals. So our Springs Fire, um, which we just had the 10-year ten, ten anniversary for that, um, I've not talked about this, but I'm happy to, to talk about this more if you guys want. Um, we had a, have a species of Dudleya, a rare species of uh, succulent plant that used to exist all over the place, all over this chunk of, of Ventura in LA County. Um, over time, it's been, its, it's distribution has been shrunken primarily by habitat destruction, habitat fragmentation, development, all that kind of stuff. Um, and by the time the Springs fire came around, we estimated we had about only, and, and now, 2013, only found in the western Santa Monica, so right here around campus and in the vicinity around, around uh, in and around campus. 50,000 individuals we think we had before the fire. The fire came and burned 100% of the habitat of this rare plant. After, um, we're not entirely sure, but we're on the order of several hundred individuals survived the fire. So we've gone from probably hundreds of thousands of individuals to tens of thousands of individuals, and now with this one event, we drop down to hundreds of individuals, right? And, and that's when we sort of start kicking in, right? So, so that, that, that's a classic story of when we intervened uh, temporally. Um, and so by definition, as you guys can imagine, after you've crashed and you're in the ER, your medical bills are crazy expensive. We gotta do all these CAT scans, we gotta do all these blood tests, we gotta do all these crazy drugs and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, way cheaper to have a rail on the side of the road, have a divided highway, have seat belts being worn, right? Th those are all measures that, that do cost some money, but avoid the catastrophe, and also in the context of this discussion, of involve way fewer resources, way less money, way less time, way less disruption to society and the goings on of life. But, but that we, we tend to be reluctant to do that, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, the last little bit here, which it's important to, this is, this is not a, an afterthought, this is an important thing. Because the species are so low and so non-abundant, when we do find them, it stops everything, right? The freeway going through stops, the, the houses being built stops, the whatever, you know, 
not at the design phase, but oftentimes in the early phases of construction. And that ticks everybody off. They're like, why do we do all this work to design this building, design this, this and now we have to stop, right? So again, that's not good for anybody. Um, so we need to get to a better place. Um, another, another critique of our, how we traditionally approach managing endangered species is um, where, as we, we've talked about this before in our context of protected areas, but where we allocate our protected spaces isn't necessarily optimal for our biodiversity goals, right? So we mentioned this, right, where, where our parks, our national parks, for example, tend to be on mountaintops and in, you know, on high alpine slopes and things of that nature, right? Not necessarily in the heart of the biodiverse area that we're, we're worried about uh, conserving, for example. And so this is one example. So this is, this is um, an old slide of mine from years and years ago. But this is um, on the big island of Hawaii. And this is um, where species are located. And you can see that they're, it's not everywhere on the island, right? There's, there's different areas of hot spots where there are more individuals concentrated relative to others. And the hashed lines, this guy right here, this is where the, this color is the protected area. So here's protected area, protected area, protected area, protected area, protected area, protected area. But here are where the species, where the species richness is the greatest, right? So there's this mismatch. Um, and uh, and we can and, and we we um, might want to say take another approach. Might want to say sort of a first principles approach. Hey, where where would we maybe want to? Um, put some protected area or put some refuges for critters. So we, we could take a different approach where we maybe say instead of, instead of putting them where, just where, where they were convenient or where they were, we had unused land or something of that nature, um, maybe we could say, hey, let's, let's look at some objective criteria. Maybe in this case it's, it's uh, different uh, uh, temperature and soil moisture and, and soils and, and sort of put that stuff all together and then create a map and then say, oh, maybe we should do some prioritizing of our conservation efforts in these areas. Um, but that's not what we have, right? So this is the so-called, remember we talked about for endangered species that once they've been listed or once they're declared, the next step is to figure out their recovery. And part of that recovery is to de designate critical habitat. So this is, as of, uh, as of last week, this is the designated um, critical habitat in the lower 48 for um, threatened and endangered species, right? And um, suffice it to say, this doesn't look like one of these maps, right? This looks like, um, uh, it doesn't look evenly distributed, and as we've said before, not a lot in the Midwest, right? Uh, there's, we sort of have these hot spots of areas that are concentrated, typically in the western U.S., um, and so, so that's maybe not the best thing if we're trying to conserve all of our species or a representative composition of all of our species um, across the U.S. Okay, so the response to this has been this new tool that we're going to talk about today, which is this idea of habitat conservation plans. These were first, this idea was first introduced in the 1980 amendment to the Endangered Species Act. And it, it's built around, the initial thing was this idea of incidental take, as we've, as we've touched on in the past. So recall, taking is any type of impact on a threatened or endangered species. Um, but as we also discussed, sometimes just in the course of our doing our regular do, maybe cars driving on a highway or, or the expansion of a of a bridge for, for earthquake uh, uh, retrofitting or something of that nature, we um, have a high likelihood of having some type of taking, either disturbing endangered species or, or actually causing mortality to one or more individuals. Okay, um, so if we got a, um, so, so, so the, the idea of this habitat conservation plan is to try to um, deal with some of those concerns to allow some activities to go on, but to do it in a way that leads to better recovery of the overall um, species, of the overall uh, management uh, target. Okay, so if you get an, if you get an incidental take permit, um, the, the argument here is that, uh, that what you agree to, or the permit says you have to do, is, is 
take only stuff accidentally. You can't intentionally try to shoot the bald eagle or the condor or whatever it is, right? So it has to be um, inadvertent to what you're doing. So you couldn't, you couldn't get an incidental take permit and start a hunting operation, for example, right? Okay, uh, next, um, the applicant is gonna do everything practicable to avoid hurting these uh, critters. Um, and then, here's, an, here's, a, here's a key part of this. We, we talked about before the, the limited money, right? Limited funding issues. The applicant is gonna ensure that there's adequate funding available to do whatever the management intervention thing is, okay? So by allowing folks to sort of maybe take, have some incidental take, they will assure that the other activities are, are adequately funded. Uh, those will be agreed to uh, in the permit, but, but that's a key thing. Um, and that even if it's incidental, it wouldn't take the species down to basically a uh, non-viable level, right? So we're talking, um, we could, if we had 100 individuals left, maybe we'd, we'd hit, maybe you could have an incidental take on one or two or three or whatever the species is, but you wouldn't be able to have an incidental take of 75 individuals, that kind of thing. Um, and then any other additional uh, measures, in this case by the Secretary of the Interior, would, would be met. Okay, so to talk about how this, how this works, we're gonna look at the, 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 first, the first example of this, the first case study, if you will. And so we're gonna go up to the San Francisco Bay Area where the very first Habitat Conservation Plan uh, was uh, created and enacted. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Okay, so we're gonna go up to the San Francisco uh, Peninsula just, just on the border of um, uh, the southern border of, of the city of San Francisco. The city and county are the same thing in San Francisco. So, it's, so the, the, the boundaries are exactly the same. And so what we're looking at is the top, of the, the, the tip of the San Francisco Peninsula up there where you see that little um, hut there, that line is designating, that's essentially now the county line. And so this is a, this is a map showing the approximate um, high concentrations of Ohlone and other Native American villages in the early 1600s, right? And so what we see is right in this area, there, there, there look like there's you know, some human settlement and have, have been some human settlement for a while. By the early 1800s, this area has been divided into the ranchero area uh, era and, and uh, first with Spanish um, rule and then with Mexican rule and then eventually this would flop over into American rule. But the point is um, we start to see the land being divided. Um, and by the early 1800s, we have different farms and territories and ranches uh, s stretching across this region of California. So we're going to focus on this place called San Bruno Mountain. Has anybody been to San Bruno Mountain? No. no. Okay. This is basically where I was born. So, um, so this is what it looks like if we look down uh, with a, a, a recent. S why did you guys not be able to see that? I'm not sure why you guys can't see that on the screen. Um, uh, so if we look down now at a um, current satellite image, we're looking at the city of San Francisco. Here we see uh, Golden Gate Park. San Francisco Bay is over here. The Pacific Ocean is over here. Uh, this is Ocean Beach, um, and this thing here, and so we see massive urbanization, right? Heavily, heavily uh, altered ecosystem. And this area here, this big sort of non-developed area is San Bruno Mountain. That's what we're talking about. And this is essentially, this is essentially the, the, the uh, San Francisco County line, San Francisco San Mateo County line, right about there. Okay. So um, we have San Bruno Mountain, and San Bruno Mountain is a, is a mountainous place. We've been used by different people for different, different things. We, we've had grazing up there, et cetera, but still it's, it's relatively undisturbed, right, compared to the rest of the surrounding concrete uh, jungle. This is a view from near one of the peaks, a uh, relatively recent view. Actually, it's from... 20 years ago, but it still looks roughly the same um, there. Okay, on this area, we mostly had, in terms of the management for the last you know, couple hundred years, it was mostly cattle grazing um, and, and folks putting up fences and then having their cattle constrained to certain pens, that type of thing. 
Uh, then we have the 1906 earthquake. So the 1906 earthquake gives us the goal. We had the Golden Gate Park before, but if you look at this, it looks like it looks like a big rectangle, and then it might be a little hard to tell on this map. Then there's a little teeny rectangle over here. The, San, the Golden Gate Park used to go all the way up to here, but when the 1906 earthquake happened and caused this massive shaking, which then led to these massive fires, which were really the destruction. So most of the death and destruction came from the, the, the secondary disaster, the knock-on effect of these massive, they call the Great Conflagration, the great, this massive wildfire, not wildfire, but this massive urban fire. And then we had uh, aftershocks and people were freaked out. So people literally moved out of their houses and put up tents in the middle of Golden Gate Park because that was a natural space so there weren't buildings to fall on them. And essentially we did so much development, we ended up carving out that chunk. So that chunk of the Golden Gate Park is no longer, um, is, is, now, is now developed basically. Um, and so that causes this massive demand for housing, right? People are like, oh my gosh, all the, all that housing stock is screwed up or it's burned down or whatever. We just need some more, we need some more um, places for folks to live. And so people turn to this area, turn to San Bruno Mountain. And we start to see at the time, it was pretty much like this, empty, right? And we start to see this filling in on, of the edges, you know, kind of eating around from the, the corners of San Bruno Mountain. Uh, by 1929, we have cities right, right around here, right around here that, that are established and go in. Um, and um, people start, you know, passively recreating all around this area, picnics. Uh, right around here is, are a bunch of cemeteries. This is the, the traditional place where folks in San Francisco bury their dead. So there's a lot of cemeteries here. There's, there's generic cemeteries, there's cemeteries for different faiths, there's a pet cemetery, all this kind of stuff. And so, so this is a popular place for people to come, uh, uh, go visit your parents' grave or whatever, and then go picnic kind of thing. So, so that, that's where that takes us up to um, World War II, World War II, and you can see it in this photo. We start putting up these rail, uh, radio towers to transmit a TV to transmit a radio, to transmit emergency broadcast, that kind of stuff. Um, and so we put some roads up there. Those roads bring in more invasive species along those disturbance corridors, et cetera. And then we get to the mid 60s. So the mid 60s when we want to develop everything. So there is this insane plan, and you guys can take my coastal management class if you want to learn more about this. But there's this insane plan to, okay, as, we, as we look over here, we're looking, like over here is, is SFO, the San Francisco International Airport, and the bay. And then on the other side here, we see the other side of the, of the San Francisco Bay towards the, the East Bay, Oakland, and Alameda, and that kind of stuff. So these guys had a serious proposal, as crazy as this sounds, that a serious proposal to remove the entirety of this mountain and fill in San Francisco Bay so that we can have more land to develop. I mean, crazy. I mean, totally, totally crazy, right? Um, and so um, this essentially leads to this group called the Committee to Save San Bruno Mountain, which then leads to um, uh, some other things, which then essentially is one of the big drivers to create what's, the, what's called the, the Bay Development Commission, which then leads to the coast, helps lead to the Coastal Act. So major, major forces are, are awoken when people tried to mess with this mountain that um, have, have changed the landscape of California uh, literally and figuratively uh, ever since. So, um, so the plan to, to carve the whole mountain and throw the whole mountain in the San Francisco Bay, that, that stalls out eventually. But there's still this demand and this pressure to put these houses, on, you know, to, to, to develop, maybe not to carve the mountain down, but at least to build, build on top of the mountain, right? So by 1975, we get this large plan to put uh, more than 8,000 houses um, and a huge amount of office space uh, there. And so if you, if, you, if you fly into SFO or you drive up and, and you look um, to this area from the south, you'll see these big letters. It's not technically on San Bruno Mountain. It's on a little, mount, little hill in front of it, but it looks like it's on San Bruno Mountain. It says, South San Francisco, the industrial city, right? 
So lots of manufacturing, et cetera, is happening here. And so, and so the idea is we're also going to put a huge amount of office space to support those corporations, et cetera. Uh, we, have, we have Amgen here, right? The second oldest biotech firm in the US. The oldest is Genentech, and that's located right here. So large history of lots of development, lots of activity, lots of construction. Um, okay, so we're getting ready to develop, but then in the late 1970s, we discover some butterflies there. More, more accurately, we, the petition is made, and they are listed, and so we start to have some endangered butterflies. And those endangered butterflies, as we've learned before, the Endangered Species Act says, oh, we've got to stop, halt, these, halt this development. By 1982, we have a small amount of land in, in public ownership. Right? So a lot of this is in private parcels, private hands, and so how, how are we going to go forward with this? Here are the players. So <clears throat> um, when this first happened, we had three, now we have four, but, but we have butterflies. So the story here is our butterflies. Um, so uh, this, and this is all work of, um, so the, my postdoc, my postdoc advisor is a guy named Paul Ehrlich, and he studied all kinds of things, but in, in, in particular butterflies. And, and the center that I was a postdoc for, called the Center for Conservation Biology, did all these butterfly monitoring, did all this butterfly monitoring. So I did some of this, but a lot of this is now done by a, a colleague of mine named Stu Weiss and his team. And so, they, so this is various things that I've pulled together from various stuff that, that we've done over the years or they've sent or there's public reports, that kind of stuff. Okay, so this one is very pretty butterfly called the Mission Blue, little teeny tiny butterfly. Um, and uh, the important thing with butterflies, just so we're on the same page, we haven't we mentioned them very briefly in the context of metapopulations, but um, importantly, uh, generally speaking, not always true, but for most butterfly species, the adult, the thing that we see that we identify as a butterfly, that's alive for a very small window, days to weeks typically, right? And that's the last stage. That's the stage it exists to mate and lay and, and, and lay eggs, you know oviposit and do that kind of stuff and then die, basically. Some adult life history stages, they can persist for a longer amount of time. Monarch butterflies would be the classic example of that, which can live for years, but, but most butterflies a little bit. So they're spending most of their life in a different life history stage than we see here. They're spending most of their life as a, as a larva, as, as one different instar stage of, of um, a particular uh, uh, larval stage. The adults have um, requirements. The larvae have requirements. They aren't necessarily the same. So there might be a host plant that the, the larvae needs to feed on. And there might be um, another, a nectar plant, let's say, that the adult butterfly needs to feed on while, while he or she is flying around in the, in the stuff, right? So we have these specific relationships and so there's a, usually a tight coevolution here of butterflies and their plants, their host plants, or, and, the, and this and that. And so as we have these disturbances, climate change, invasive species, habitat destruction, it tends to decouple these relationships and then we tend to lose the butterflies. So um, yeah, okay, so this guy was, this guy was uh, listed in 1976, so very early on. Then we have the uh, Calippe silver spot. This individual is a little bit bigger. Um, also listed in 1976, a different series of, or a different set of host plants. And then we have the San Bruno elfin, um, which is also a very small individual. Um, and uh, this guy is on a lot of these really pretty lupins that people like. Some of the plants that these guys use aren't maybe super exciting. There's some plantago and stuff that people don't find very interesting. But in this case, uh, the lupins, everybody lo loves lupins. Also listed as um, endangered, in gets on the endangered species list in 1976. So butterflies are a challenge. Butterflies are, are, are kind of a bit like when we were in the intertidal and we did our wandering transects, right? So we did some traditional band transects and we started and we were in the, the shallow area and we went to the deeper area with our, with our quad rats, et cetera, right? Those are the classic ones. 
but we sometimes use other transects. And so in the case of when we went out to Khan's Bio Rock at Leo Carrillo, right, we, we, I just, I gave everybody a, a time. He said, ready, set, go. And, and we all walked around and we did a, a time constrained survey. That's how we do most of our butterfly stuff. So we have um, some time constrained wandering transects. And so that's just five, 10 minutes, whatever the deal is, 15 minutes, depends on the density in the landscape. And you and I just walk around. Because these butterflies, in the right time of year, so, so springtime, flowers are flowering, it's warm out, it's not windy. They're like, flit, 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 flit. And, and because by definition here, we're talking about rare individuals, right? There's not a ton of, not a ton of butterflies around. And so they're flit, flit, flitting around. And uh, so we're going to walk. You and I are going to walk. Walk, 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 walk. And we see how many, how many flitting individuals we see, right? That's a really efficient way to look for these guys. And we can do that just in an area, or we can walk a specific um, transect. Um, and then we can, uh, we, we can do some interpretation based on, OK, so we surveyed this chunk of the mountain, and then if we extrapolate that to the rest of the mountain, et cetera. So here's an example of some of the surveys that we do. And so we're looking down on the mountain right now, and we have um, different wandering transects. You see those red lines? These days, it's very simple. We all have GPS devices on our phones, et cetera. You can just hit log on your logging device and start walking, do your transect, come back, and then we know exactly where we are. Back in the day, it was a little bit harder to figure out where, where, where we walked exactly, but, but you guys get the idea. Okay, and so this is, this is some old data, but just to sort of give you the idea, these critters are also very responsive to the food, the, the, the food resources for them, right? And so some years, really, really good rains or really, really warm spring or whatever it is. So the plants do really well, other years not. So we see this high degree of variation, right, from year to year, potentially. So not a lot between 98 and 99, not a lot between 2001 and 2002, but between 99 and 2000 and 2000 and 2001, large swings in terms of the, the counts. And this, is, this would be the, the average number of Mission Blue butterflies. Um, same thing. Here's another example. Here's a, looking at, with Mission Blues, um, looking at these different um, a transects. And some transects are lousy with butterflies. Some have no butterflies. So there's variation both in time and there's variation in space. Same thing. So here's, here's a graphical version where, so this transect generally sucks for this, these guys. This transect is generally better, right? So this is better habitat for them. Okay. And this is uh, the most recent uh, survey from 2022 um, with the um, Calippe Silver Spot. And you can see the transects where we walked and where we um, uh, had historic observations, et cetera. OK. So now you have the background. So um, in 1980, as I mentioned, we revised the ESA. And one of the things we allowed in 1980 were the possibility for folks to apply for and get an incidental take permit, as we've said. Um, in addition to that, if we're going to allow incidental take, we have to finish a habit, a, a, um, it, it allows the option to, for folks to try out a habitat conservation plan. You don't have to do one, but, but allows for the creation of this. What is this? Habitat conservation plan is primarily developed in response to the fact where landowners wanted to do some activity and they were prevented from doing some activity because the endangered species were on their land. By doing that activity, they, um, they would harm and have a taking. So the idea here is that the developer is going to say, OK, I have whatever, I don't know, 1,000 acres. And I want to put some houses on here. I want to put my house on 1,000 acres, but I'm not going to be allowed to. So OK, so the compromise, I'm going to put my houses, I'm just making this up, on 400 acres. And these 600 acres, I'm going to deed over to permanent open space or something of that nature. OK? Um, and, uh, and so if I do that, I can, I, that might be a justification for folks to give me an incidental take permit, where I might have some incidental take on the 400 acres where I'm going to be putting my houses, that, that, that kind of idea. And so the first test case is San Bruno Mountain. This happens in 1983. And um, we have uh, this existing area, this existing publicly owned land. At, at, by this point, it's 941 hectares. So we have that property. 
but much, but all the rest of the area is in private hands, right? A, a little teeny bit, it's under um, other other entities' control where there's the uh, radio towers. But for the most of most of it, it's in private land, in private holdings. So the idea is, okay, developers, you can go ahead and do some of your homes if you let us add to our protected area. If you deed some of that land over and we expand the park. And uh, how they'll pay for it, I mentioned before they were paid for it, how they were paid for it is the homeowners, when they buy their, buy their home, there'll be some additional fee built into there. And that fee will go into a bank account and that bank account will be used to support the monitoring and, and checking in, on, and, 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 as we'll learn, management of invasive species, which is one of the biggest problems. So that will create a pot of money that will exist, that doesn't exist now, right? Um, and there we go. And so uh, while we have low numbers, generally speaking, the, the, in the wake of this, the butterfly numbers seem to have mostly been sort of okay, right? They weren't necessarily expanding like crazy, but they weren't declining further. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we're talking on the order of thousands of individuals um, here in terms of our population size. And so this is what that looked like. So here we're looking down now at a map from 1982, and we're looking in all these little, doesn't matter what they are, but you see all these, these different polygons. Those are essentially all different. Uh, some of those are different chunks of land, but they represent potential parcels that um, theoretically could have a house on them. And this is what, um, this is what it looked like if you, you know, about 20 years ago, if you look down, but you see you see that there is some natural roads here. This is, where am I looking? I'm trying to remember where this is. I think this is the 101, I think this is. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I think so. And so I'm looking at this plane. And then, um, and so historically, there, you see this big road. All the houses were, were constrained over there. Here you see the result of some of that, uh, the result of that habitat conservation plan and allowing homes to start to creep into uh, this toe, this edge of the mountain. And so these are, these are what the permitted developments look like. Uh, and again, because we were constrained land and people were trying to maximize their stuff, these houses, and then in this case, this is a, a big tall skyscraper that's starting to go up, it's completed now. Um, things are really up and down. So some of these like single family homes are like, some of them are like three or four stories because they're basically like, whoop, very small ground footprint, but they just go up and up and up. So we minimize the amount of destruction of the grassland and stuff like that. Um, but nevertheless, people are, many people are still unhappy with these things, right? So many people say that, hey, these, these habitat conservation plans are, um, are, are a way to sell out, a way to let the developers do, or whoever wants to have their impact, allow them to have the impact, and then it doesn't really lead to a good thing, and developers aren't super happy. And so there's still a lot of controversy around these issues. Um, how are we doing right now? So before we go on to the, the next part here, I just want to say how we're doing right now. So this is the most recent data we have from, for our species. So this is the, um, the elfin blue, uh, San Bruno elfin. And so last 20 years or so here in 1999. And so this is, this is a relative measure here. So this isn't all the larvae on the whole mountain, but this, these are in the monitoring transects, right? So we're going from about 140 uh, larvae uh, detected 115, 200, 200, 377, bad year. Uh, 364, 145, da, 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 to the last couple years, you know, on the order of thousands, which is pretty cool, which is good. Here is the silver spot, same thing. So let's look at, so in this case, we're looking at the transect variation. Let's pick this transect, transect one. So we had about, uh, um, this, this, and this, this is um, uh, uh, encounters per hour. And so this is uh, 2.3 in, two, in 2000, and it's nothing in 2020. This last year, we didn't find any there. Uh, 3.2 to 0 0.6. 16.15 to 4.2. Uh, 12.3 to 0 0.9, right? 5.2 to 4.4. To 4. So, so in this case, this, this um, species isn't, is, is sort of staying the same or declining, it looks like. The Mission Blue, um, from 2007 over here on the left to 2001, 
uh, 2.4 to none, zero to, they didn't survey that particular transect that year, 7.1 to none, uh, blah, blah, blah. So you see, so 2.8 to 0.83, 3.9. So generally speaking, same thing. Um, not going up dramatically. Uh, and, uh, and, and but, but still around, but still around. And then we did an introduction just in the last couple years. So I said we had those three species that were there that were listed. We've now added a fourth species um, because of the protections of the habitat conservation plan, because we have more space and confidence that, that this will be protected. And this is the bay checker spot butterfly. And so this is a species that is around elsewhere in the southern part of uh, San Francisco. It used to be all over the Bay Area, but again, habitat destruction is taking it out of most of its places. It was, rem it was gone from San Bruno Mountain uh, by the mid 80s. So we haven't seen it there for several decades. And like, you know, we have the world's top butterfly experts looking for it. So if we couldn't find it, they really weren't there. So they truly were extirpated. Sometimes we just don't look and we assume something's been extinct from the area. But, but th in this case, it really was. So it took a lot of time, but basically we got permission the last few years to bring some individuals, some larvae from populations that are relatively healthy down at, by San Jose, put them in a the car, drive them up, and let them go on their, on their host plants. And uh, this, is, this, is their, this is the um, species, this plantago, that is the host plant for them that is becoming rare. This is an invasive species. In fact, this is the one that you saw when you were out doing surveys in our grassland up here. So a couple of you guys got some of that, that plant, I call it the plantain, is it, you guys got the plantain? That's what you saw. So this is a weedy invasive species. But recent research has found that um, some butterflies have, historically they've not, they don't like this, but some of them have now started to adapt to it. So some of them like beggars can't be like, I'd really like that really awesome dinner but if there isn't anything, I guess I'll have the chicken nuggets reheated in the microwave, right? It's like, at least there's some chicken nuggets, right? So that's what seems to be happening. So because some studies elsewhere suggested that these similar species could use this invasive potentially as a host plant, um, and, there, and there's a lot of that invasive up there, um, we got permission to try to, tr to transplant some of these individuals, put them up there, and this is what's been, and so this is the population of those individuals they came from, the donor populations. So not, not, tens or hundreds or thousands of individuals, but like tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of individuals from these donor populations. So there was a lot of larvae we could, we could grab. And so this is what we did. So again, this is an aerial photo looking down. These are the areas where we released these new baby, um, these, these larval um, butterflies uh, in these different areas in different uh, years. And so this, these are how many larvae we released each year. Um, and then this is um, uh, how many adults we surveyed. And so by definition, these are all new individuals, right? So these are, the, these are how, many, how many we try to add to the population. And so we didn't, 2017, by definition, we didn't have anybody because that was the year we started. So there wouldn't have been any adults. But um, uh, three, 91, eight, seven, 16. So still low, but this is showing they're starting to come back, right? So. So this is, this is a good sign that at least it seems like they can persist. Maybe they might not thrive, but at least they can, they can theoretically exist on this alternative host, it looks like. Other things are here, garter snake. We haven't seen it in 30 years. The garter snake and the California red-legged frog need w water features and things like that. We don't really have those on San Bruno Mountain. So it's not surprising. But, but these are two species of concern that we'd like to see more of, but we, we've not seen them in this area. We have a lot of rare plants. These are some, just a few examples of them I've listed for you. We have a lot of rare plants, and they're also a focus of conservation work to try to plant, grow up individuals, plant them out. Uh, much like some of our students are working with the National Park Service and our grasslands here, to, uh, and some of you guys are working on oak restoration, same kind of idea. And then a lot of invasives. We're, we're always battling invasive species here to try to keep those numbers down. So um, that's where we are right now. This approach has become super popular. In the wake of San Bruno Mountain, this has now become a really um, popular approach to dealing with endangered species. So um, 
the, so I'll, I'll tell you the, the classic version before we had habitat conservation plans were like this, right? And we've heard, we heard a presentation. Some of you guys did your species uh, poster on the gnat catcher, California coastal gnat catcher. And so as, you've, as you heard, um, critter that lives in these coastal sage scrub communities, these coastal shrublands type things, um, highly screwed up by the fact that we're, we fragmented and destroyed most of this stuff primarily with housing, right? And so all of a sudden we list these guys and now this freezes all this development. And especially in places like Orange County, it makes everybody PO'd. What do you mean? Why can't we put a house in here? What are you talking about? The bird can fly away. What are you doing? You know, da 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 da. So um, all kinds of lawsuits, all kinds of anger. This was the traditional single species based approach to managing endangerment, right? It was all 100% looking at the coastal gnat catcher. Is this house going to hurt this individual, right? That kind of thing. And so that helps that, that so, so, so this is coming along the same time as we have this new tool that's evolving, this habitat conservation plan tool. And so remember that um, uh, the ESA talks about species, but they all, the, the law also references their habitat. So that's sort of the avenue here into this habitat conservation plan. And so we designate this critical habitat, that this is area that, area that the critter needs to live, and that now can be viewed as the start of what could be a habitat conservation planning process. So the idea here is that nowadays all of these are multi-species. So no longer would we create a, um, a recovery plan or, or, or habitat conservation plan for species X. It would be for a suite of critters. It would be for grassland birds. It would be for grassland organisms. It would be for oak woodland community kind of thing, right? And this seems to be work to work much better. Our version, our flavor in California is called the Natural Community Conservation Plan, or, or called a nat NCCP is for short. Um, and again, it's trying to get at this thing of, of everything stops down at the last minute as the critters are going off the cliff, right? So we're trying to get out in front of it. So can we prevent the critters from becoming endangered in the first place? And we can, can we do it more efficiently in terms of people's time and in terms of dollars by doing them as a community rather than a species by species by species by species approach? And so as of today, we have 40 different, in California, we have 40 different so habitat conservation plans are from the feds, right? The, the federal folks. The state-driven process are NCCPs, but they're, they're very similar, same, same idea. I mean, there, is, there are differences, but, but by and large, they're a similar approach, right? And then on the right, I have the most recent map, which is from 2019, which doesn't include uh, this one that we'll talk about in a sec, but, but, um, but includes most of those. And you, so you guys can see where they are, right? They're, or you, uh, you tell me. So what, what pattern do you notice to where these, uh, these NCCPs are in California? Somebody that hasn't spoken lately. Somebody. Maria. What, 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 interpret the, so what, what, what might be going on with this map here for me? <coughs> or or, or, or why, why the colors where the colors are? Uh, Eddie, help her out. What, what, what might be a possible idea? Um, I see a lot in San Diego. Uh -huh. and a lot of these neighborhoods are incredibly wealthy neighborhoods. Okay. Okay, so we have... Looks like there's a lot in, in San Diego County. San Diego has definitely leaned into this tool very aggressively. Um, and so, so uh, a lot of residential areas there. Okay. What else? What else might be going on? Some of them seem to be more inland, but the more changes uh, on the coast. Yeah, so, um, so so the coast is already pretty heavily developed by and large, right? So, so we don't have as much opportunity there. 
these things are are in the areas where not not everywhere, but by and large, where there there weren't there, there was still remnant habitat starting in like say the mid '80s, right? And so so the edges of the Central Valley, um, the the parts where people were wanting to put houses east of San Diego, those types of places. Not so much in Northern California or in the Sierras, because a lot of that's already federal land. A lot of that's already protected, right? So we, we wouldn't need it there. Again, this is a technique primarily to deal with private land and private holdings. And also, there isn't a massive demand to put a bunch of, I don't know, high rises in the Eastern Sierras or something like that, right? So it's, it's, it's sort of a map where we, want, where we want to do growth. So do people still apply for the uh, ITC? Uh, incidental take permits? Uh, you, you could, but generally speaking, for this development, you would get the incidental take when you establish the habitat conservation plan. So it'd sort of be like, it, it, they're, they're, one isn't necessarily quote unquote dependent on the other, but it would, it would fast, it, would, it, it might be a condition. If, if I give you this incidental take, you will establish some, t you, you will participate or help fund or something, this habitat conservation plan, this multi-species planning uh, umbrella approach. Okay. Okay. So the popularity is just is you know started like with with San Bernardino Mountain. It's just been it's just exploded ever since. Um, uh, so again, generally, uh, how we see this this multiple species or community based um, planning in the context of endangered species is creating habitats, usually in an island of of transformed landscape. Oftentimes, that's that's urban. It could be ag, but more typically it's urban. Um, the general idea there is to get more area preserved for more species that will do more good for the most, the most amount of good for the most amount of individuals is the idea. As much as possible, we'd like to do large scale planning. So rather than a postage stamp, a large chunk. So when we look over here, we look over here, these are large areas. These are huge areas, right? And so if we do it right, that's going to be a large chunk of, of landscape that's not, that doesn't have any houses in it kind of thing, right? Um, and so we see these all over the, all over the country. Um, this is our flavor, and here in California, this is our state-based state, uh, effort. Our version starts in 1991, where the first act was passed and amended for a while. Currently, we have another act that is superseded. So the current goings on from here forward are the uh, Natural Communities Conservation Planning Act of 2003, and it's been amended a couple times. Um, and this is, this is the California Fish and Game Code section that, that, it, uh, that, that governs it. Um, I would just note that, without going too much into the legalese, that the first line of the, of the bill notes that this is... Um, uh, human population, the number of humans on the planet, and development pressures are a fundamental threat to natural, uh, natural ecosystems. And so that, that's sort of like, so we start from that premise. So um, I think that's important to, to say frequently and remind people of. Um, oh, this is an old slide. It says California Department of Fish and Game initially was the lead agency. Now we've designated that as California Fish and Wildlife. So so originally it was called Fish and Game, but now we would use a W instead of a G at the end of the name. So they're the lead agency. And, and the charge with this is to identify and provide for the regional or area-wide protection and perpetuation of natural wildlife diversity while, while allowing compatible and appropriate development and growth. Um, and so this, this allows for negotiated agreements, um, non-regulatory guidelines when something doesn't fit into an existing um, law, but yet we think it's probably important. We can we can negotiate that agree with the parties, and allows um, for uh, uh, incidental take permits. Okay, so let's look at the the San Diego flavor of this. So this was um, this is one of the the most sophisticated ones. This is quite good, uh, and this is they call they call their particular. Everybody has their own name for. Everybody has their own unique name. So there isn't a consistent naming convention. This one's called the San Diego Multi-Species Conservation Plan. So it is a voluntary thing. So no one was forced to do this, 
but there were strong advantages, so there was enticement to, right? If you got in, you would get to be able to streamline stuff and things like that. So it was voluntary, um, and it was helping. So one of the problems our developers say, our developer friends say, is like, look, I do all this work, I pull all this money together, I get all this stuff going, and then, all right, and then, I spend five years, 10 years, and all of a sudden, boom, it all changes. You change it because we discovered an endangered species. So this allows them uh, certainty, right? This allows them that even if we discover a rare butterfly on your property, because we have this nearby reserve, this, this planning process that, is, that can hopefully house that species and keep it going, we won't be having some last minute surprise that all of a sudden all this work you've done for eight years suddenly goes, gets frozen, right? Um, and so, and so, so that, that's a really important thing. That's a really um, key part of this. Um, some private property rights advocates don't like it. Um, they say that our existing zoning laws for where houses can go and can't go and this and that are already a problem. This is the crowd that doesn't like any of this type of stuff. Um, and uh, and it's, 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 it's just going to lead to all these other problems, right? Um, but... Nevertheless, these seem to have worked. They seem to be working quite well. So here's another example. This is the Central Coastal Natural Community Conservation Plan, <sighs> right? So, so um, this one has elements of all these different counties, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the issues we're, we're going to watch a little short video here to, to wrap up this this module, um, but uh, we're going to look at the most recent. NCCP that's been created, which is the Placer County Conservation Plan, which was um, finally agreed, or finally established in 2021. But I just want to note that these are long. This is this addresses some of the, the the criticisms we had with the ESA, but not all. In particular, the takes a long time thing. This takes a long time. So let's look at this. So here, this is, this is from, I just grabbed the web page from Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, this morning. But check it out. So uh, here's the documents. Planning agreement, 2001, amended 2019. Independent science advisory report, 2004. Uh, plan documents, 2020. Uh, environmental review documents, the final EIS, EIR, 2020. Uh, uh, 2020. Implementing, da, 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 da. so we're talking, you know, 20 years here. This is somebody that you guys would get, some of you guys are getting ready to graduate. You're going to go work for some folks. Maybe you're going to work for the agency. You would maybe start working on this plan now. And then when you're getting ready to retire, maybe it would be done, right? So that's a problem. Of course, we want people to be thorough. Of course, we want people to take their time. But 20 years, that doesn't seem like that's a great thing, right? Um, so that's still a very real concern. And because it takes so much time and resources, we actually have funding sources for this. So there's federal funding sources, there's state funding sources to provide groups with the funding over the long term to, to do these particular scientific studies or, or legal analyses or whatever it is. Okay. So let's take a look at, we'll just watch this, just a short like 10 minute video. This is the overview of this most recent NCCP in Placer County, Cali Placer County, California. We have heard about a new program in Placer County, the Placer County Conservation Program, generally referred to as the PCCP, developed to protect the areas that make Placer County such a beautiful place to live. This video is an overview of the PCCP to help explain what covered activities and covered species are and how it applies to public and private development projects while conserving natural resources and agriculture in western Placer County. The PCCP plan area covers approximately 201,000 acres of Western Placer County, including the city of Lincoln, and is comprised of two plan areas, the Valley and the Foothills. It does not include the cities of Auburn, Rockland, Roseville, or the town of Loomis, as most of these areas have been built out. Adopted by the Placer County Board of Supervisors and the city of Lincoln in September 2020, after over 20 years in the making, the PCCP strikes a balance between conservation and economic development. Providing a conservation framework to protect, enhance, and restore natural resources, including open space, agriculture, species protection, and wetland preservation, the program achieves state and federal conservation goals through regulatory permit coverage, 
to protect and manage forty seven thousand three hundred acres over the first fifty years of the program this permit coverage serves to accommodate the anticipated growth in the region while streamlining the environmental permitting coverage required of covered activities the pccp includes three separate but complementary components the first component of the program is the western placer county habitat conservation plan or hcp and the natural community conservation plan or nccp so one's Both fed one state combined are referred to as the plan covering 14 species and their habitats the second component is the western placer county aquatic resources program or carp protecting stream systems wetlands and other aquatic resources and the third component is the western placer county in lieu fee program providing compensatory mitigation for impacts for projects and activities that are covered under the plan and the carp the PCCP has both natural and semi-natural community types. Natural communities consist of grassland, vernal pool complex, aquatic wetland complex, riverine riparian complex, oak woodland, and valley oak woodland. The semi-natural communities are agriculture, including rice and field agriculture, and orchard and vineyard agriculture. All of these community types provide valuable habitat for wildlife species that have been identified by state and federal agencies as threatened, endangered, or species of concern. The PCCP seeks to preserve these habitats through avoiding or minimizing impacts to them in order to ensure the program's 14 covered species will survive and thrive in Western Placer County. The covered species identified for protection under the PCCP include four birds, swains and sock, California black rail, western burrowing owl, and tricolored blackbird, two reptiles, giant garter snake and western pond turtle, two amphibians, foothill yellow-legged frog and California red-legged frog, two fish, Central Valley steelhead and Central Valley fall, late fall run Chinook salmon, and four invertebrates, Valley elderberry longhorn beetle, conservancy fairy shrimp, vernal pool fairy shrimp, and vernal pool tadpole shrimp. The County Aquatic Resources Program, or CARP, is one of the three components mentioned earlier that make up the PCCP and specifically addresses impacts and mitigation for streams, wetlands, and water quality. CARP authorization is required prior to any impact on aquatic resources within the PCCP plan area when the project is an HCP and CCP covered activity. To determine whether a project requires CARP authorization, three simple questions need to be answered. One, is the project a covered activity? Two, does the project site have aquatic resources such as streams or wetlands on site? And three, is the project proposing to impact these aquatic resources? If all three questions were answered with a yes, a CARP authorization is required for the proposed project. When a CARP authorization is required, the applicant is responsible for filling out the CARP sections of the PCCP slash CARP authorization application. And the applicant would be a, a, a developer, a homeowner, a, a farmer, somebody like that. Covered activity and covered project have been referred to a few times now and can include building permits on properties as small as 20,000 square feet or about half an acre. A decision tree has been developed to help explain that not all building permits require PCCP coverage. It can be found on the county's PCCP webpage online at placer.ca.gov forward slash PCCP and has links embedded to find a property's land cover and to email planning technicians with questions about whether a building permit will require mitigation through the PCCP. Covered activities will require a PCCP certificate of authorization prior to any permits being issued that will result in ground disturbance. Project applicants are required to submit specific information about the property with the help of a qualified... So these fees will go into a fund that will be used to help the management of the other, of the, you know, area outside of the place being affected. In order for the proposed project to be assessed for impacts and for the planner to determine what the mitigation fees will be. There are three different types of PCCP mitigation fees that could apply. All covered projects are subject to land conversion fees. I can't make you go and fast. special <laughs> habitat fees are required as well when wetlands, vernal pools, riverine riparian areas, stream systems, and stream systems with salmon habitat are impacted. Temporary effects fees will be applied to projects where, for example, 
impacts from a construction staging area can be restored to its original state. The land conversion fee is based on the cost of mitigating each covered activity's impacts on covered species and natural communities. It offsets the cost to acquire land. Okay, so this is a key idea here. This idea is mitigation. So this idea is we're going to allow an impact to happen. We're going to allow, you know, the grassland's going to become a house or whatever the heck the thing is, right? But the 20 years of this plan development have gone into and people have sort of figured out that what do we need to do? Um, the classic example, you messed up a wetland or you impacted a wetland. How do we make another wetland? And so now we have some idea about how much that would cost, right? And so, so that, that's where the basis for these fees come in and that's what the mitigation is referring to, mitigating the impact here in this in this, in this HCP, this NCCP area uh, nearby. Question. Yeah. Mr. If you want to build any land within the PCCP, is that what, when you have to get authorization from that? Yes. Uh, uh, so, so if it's minor, if it's a little teeny thing, so if it's your house and you're going to put like an outhouse out there, maybe not. Mm -hmm. but, if, but that's what they're saying. There's some criteria where if it's above a certain size, then yes. Yeah, like 20,000. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then some things. Pay for fire hazard management yeah. and long term management of the reserve lands and their resources for the benefit of current and future generations. Land conversion fees are calculated separately for the valley and foothills. So, depending on where the project is, the land conversion fees for similar projects may be different. Once these and any other required fees are paid, a certificate of authorization for permits resulting in ground disturbance can be issued. There are several types of habitat that require an additional mitigation fee to cover the cost. So this of is the answer to your question. So impacted. some things, it does, any impact to will trigger these special trigger. habitat fees are vernal pools, vernal pool wetlands and their immediate watersheds, aquatic wetlands, riverine and riparian drainages, streams and creeks, vegetative buffers of those riverine and riparian areas, stream systems, and finally, salmonid stream channels. When applicable, these fees are paid in addition to the land conversion fee. The PCCP CARP application process is folded into the application process for discretionary permits, like major subdivisions or minor land divisions that require environmental review and or a public hearing, and some ministerial permits like a single family residential permit that otherwise meets setbacks and other zoning clearances that are determined to be covered projects, as mentioned earlier when we were looking at the decision tree for building permits. Pre-development meetings for discretionary projects are opportunities for project applicants to be informed of necessary okay. surveys I think, I think and reports. I think we don't need to Those go through all these steps. You, you guys get the idea. And determine whether pre construct Okay. So, uh, so... You may have heard about a new program. Well, what, 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 okay, so, so you, you guys get the idea. So, um, so this approach is, it sounds very bureaucratic. It, it can be very bureaucratic. It takes a long time. But elements that we've talked about over the semester are getting sucked into here, right? It's sort of like becoming like a mothership. There's protected area stuff, right? There's, there's single species management stuff. There's this idea related to island biogeography and, and all those things, right? So, so the trigger for some of these things are endangered species, right? But, but it's a pathway into this sort of what we think is like sort of state of the art of conservation science, right? So all these things are supported with, with research, right? So that if we, if we put in a wetland over here, we can make another wetland. We can synthesize a wetland. If we, if we fragment this air, if, if this part of the community gets fragmented, we're going to work to reconnect this area over there, et cetera. So start with the Endangered Species Act, which is one of the most you know, powerful environmental laws, but that's going to take us to these other things. And importantly, this is also a pathway to bring everybody together, right? This isn't saying, no, 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 don't ever do that. You know, in an ideal world, you maybe say, yeah, no more houses here, right? But that's just unrealistic. And so this is a way to allow everybody to go forward where we have some compromise, but yet we have rigorous science behind it, et cetera. So whether this era of HCCPs, NCCPs will turn out to be the bomb, 
it's a little hard to know because as we've seen, it takes a decade or two to get these things enacted. And we need to see how they go for a decade or two to, 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 to you know, know if they're really working. San Bruno Mountain, is it working? No. Eddie says no. They're certainly not thriving. The butterflies certainly aren't burbling out and getting hit by cars on the freeway. They're so abundant, right? But if you look at the other areas that don't have this protection, those butterflies have winked off. There's another park in San Francisco where they used to have a, a population and they, they've gone extinct. So, so it's a real question. Are we managing for recovery or are we just managing to not let the thing go extinct? And so um, at a minimum, these, these efforts are trying to manage to not let the thing go extinct. But, are, but if, are they really managing to get us off the endangered species list? That's a totally valid uh, critique. Um, uh, so yeah, so that, that's where we are. So, so, I, so I would argue again that this idea of habitat conservation plans, multi-species approaches, is an adaptation of the ESA taking into account the criticism that people had, right? Not perfect, but adapting as we go forward. Adapting as we go forward. So cool. Questions about that? Questions about HTCPs? Make sense? It says it takes like decades. Why is, it, why is it a slow process? That's just the nature of it, or is it so urgent to do so people can do it? Oh, man, that's a great question. So we would need lots of beers to properly discuss this problem. Mm -hmm. But so, the, the, so Max's question is, why does it take years? Um, Uh, well, I would say one, uh, the, 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 it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to take years is the first answer, right? We've sort of become accustomed to this. Primarily, it's because these efforts are not adequately funded. So may, rather than having like 100 of us go out and do some surveys this week and count all the fish, it's like money for three of us to go out, right? So we can do, so, so all this stuff, all this, like all this stuff, is done by, the surveys are primarily now done by my old friend and his sort of um, one shop or, or, or one person consulting firm or one person consulting firm that he hires a few folks like you guys for seasonal biologists kind of thing. So this isn't, this isn't like, we don't have like hundreds of people out here going to doing stuff and, and um, like one of the rules in, not what rules, I should be careful, one, one of the expectations when I was a postdoc, I said I would, we'd all go out and help with butterfly surveys. Like all the postdocs, all the grad students would go out because they were just like, we need help, right? Weren't really paid for that, but it was, it was great. It was cool to learn about butterflies, but it, you know what I'm saying? So it's not like we had this massive resource of funding for all this, right? So, so one is if we had more money, it would get done faster. Two, in some cases, we are literally inventing things. How are, so the wildlife, so the classic example maybe be our, our wildlife corridor we saw, we visited earlier this semester, right? Which is this cool structure. Um, we never built something like that over that busy a free, we've never built something like that over that busy a freeway before. So there's all kinds of constraints and things of that nature. So there's some engine, literally some engineering things to deal with. So there's sort of invent some stuff and then there's the bureaucracy. So one of the big critiques about conservation in California, not just Kansas, conservation in general stuff in California, is the crazy Byzantine bureaucracy. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to put this up here and then end this so I don't say this on the recording. Let me stop that. <laughs> 